Thank you very much, Mr. Hanley. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've elected so far to do it without microphone, uh, though there's certain background noise. So are we okay in the last rows? Uh, all right, if I start fading, then I expect to hear uh, or see arms waving to start up. So this is a, um, we have an hour in which for me to present uh, more slides than you want to see, uh, addressing issues of cities and education in Africa from 1750 roughly to today. So trying to make one presentation on the African continent and adopt some issues that are of interest that are definitely not all the issues. We try to be selective, but uh, the, the uh, rise of uh, urban Africa in especially the last 50 years, but with important cities going back hundreds of years, and the expansion of education in Africa are two dimensions of the continent that I just wanted to emphasize particularly. And before I go to the next slide, there's another word or so on myself is uh, that uh, to underscore uh, that I was trained initially as a historian of Africa, worked on economic history and other uh, related issues drawn into cultural history with time, and then got drawn into his uh, history of Africa's connection to the rest of the world through slave trade. That led me eventually to writing um, a large-scale study of the African diaspora, that is linking together the, the history of the African continent for the last five or six centuries as it's linked to the history of the people who left Africa, many in slavery and ended up in the Americas, but ended up in all different parts of Asia and Europe and treat that as a common experience. Really, it's a big hunk of world history overall. And this is the sort of approach that I take is to argue that the experience of Africa and Africans and their descendants around the world is a a, a large hunk, an interesting portion of the history of all of us. Um, so uh, first we'll uh, do a little bit of background to the African continent and this is to remind you about the main conventional regions as they are given. West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa are the regions we'll focus on most and these are contemporary populations. As of 2010 you see that West Africa is uh, the most populous part of Africa. East Africa, much the same size. Uh, Central Africa, same size, but with half as much population as West Africa. Uh, so West Africa is about half the size of the U.S., but has a, a slightly larger population than the U.S. So those regions, I'll, I'll organize the presentation into what's West and what's Central and what's East Africa. Um, we can talk about the rest of the continent as well. Um, Here's an emphasis on the size of the African continent. So I put it up there with Eurasia uh, in uh, a look at, that's half the globe there. And what I want to emphasize is that the physical area of Africa is 55% of Eurasia. That's not Asia, that's Eurasia, including Europe. Um, and furthermore, uh, that the African population is relatively dense. There are now a billion people, over a billion people on the African continent. So one way to think about the population of the world is to say, okay, uh, oops, I moved slide, I didn't want to go there yet. Uh, this is the one. Um, so a billion people in, uh, on the African continent. We got a billion people in South Asia. We got a billion people in China kind of near a billion people in Europe, and then North and South America all together, that's another billion, so seven billion. There we are. So those relative population proportions have probably been the same uh, with some interesting ups and downs for a long time, far into the past. Of course, we have 10 times as many people now on Earth as we had five centuries ago. And this is just a peek at the education issue that we're going to take a look at. The uh, places that are gray in either case are places where they don't have data. But these uh, 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 colored ones, so there's one yellow, so this is someplace between 2 and 4 percent of the population could read, had been schooled in 1950, and then by 2010 the proportions have changed really dramatically. Not overemphasizing, not, not 
replacing all of the losses, okay? So African adult literacy is now pretty much 50% of people are adult, are literate in, in a language, probably their second language, so English or French or Portuguese or Arabic, uh, but nonetheless, it's a tremendous expansion in schooling uh, in the last 50, 60 years, really in the time since African countries have been independent. And then a downer, a reminder, of the disease environment of Africa where malaria is still prevalent uh, in the whole tropical area of the continent and it, it ex exerts a big loss in, at the level of childhood and then those who survive that and develop a, not an immunity but an ability to withstand um, a malaria but periods of time one is interrupted and slowed down and made sick and feverish. It's like the worst case of flu. That was my experience with um, malaria. Uh, so that's there. That's the one look we'll get at that. Okay, so now I want to give a few slides showing issues in cities and education for this period from roughly 1700 to 1850. And we begin with the city of Timbuktu. So Timbuktu is in West Africa. It's right at the fringe of the Sahara Desert. Um, and so it's, um, it's, you know, it's pretty dry there. It's near to the Niger River, this major river course that comes through the area. But it's a storied city, a place that has been a center of scholarship for a long time. Uh, and this is a picture that was drawn by a, a French visitor to uh, Timbuktu uh, shortly after 1800. Uh, here's the mosque, or the main mosque. There are smaller ones throughout the city. Um, and here's a, a document. So this is written in Arabic language. Um, I'm not going to try to go into the details of the document, but just to say that Timbuktu was a place which was a great center of learning. Not a formal university with big buildings, but a, a university in the sense that leading scholars took in students and went over uh, issues in Islamic law and theology and genealogy, the whole set of normal studies that they had. And um, the, in, within the last 20 to 30 years, the manuscripts that families in Timbuktu held on to quietly, not telling anybody about, have been brought out into the open and have been, uh, uh, many of them are, are put into some very impressive, uh, very modern library facilities cl with climate control and careful protection of the, of the resources. And so the, the, what it has demonstrated is that the level of learning from the old days in Timbuktu was not in any ways an exaggeration. It's surprising to see how much literacy has shown up in this area of the West African savanna. And um, um, then, uh, you know, they had a rough time as the area was taken over with some people claiming to be Muslims, but who were also against most of the traditions of Islam and sought to destroy the libraries, but really very little ended up being destroyed. And in, in a time since then, people in many other parts of West Africa have begun to bring out the books of their ancestors as well. So a very interesting revival of the history of literary culture in West Africa showing up nowadays. This is the city of Kano. This is northern Nigeria, very near the border of uh, Niger, a city which is now close to two million people. But this is an 1850 um, drawing of it by a German visitor, Heinrich Bart. It was a major center of uh, commerce and uh, industry, big uh, uh, dye pits for production of, of indigo dyed uh, cotton cloth manufactured in the area. Um, now we go down to the coast of West Africa. This is the Elmina Fortress. Uh, you see it's got a Dutch flag here because the Dutch took it away from the Portuguese. The Portuguese built it in 1482 uh, as a center from which to uh, organize their purchase of gold from what was then the Gold Coast and is now Ghana. Um, and then the Dutch, trying to conquer every place the Portuguese had conquered, took it over in the uh, 1630s. Um, and um, so, you, so it's a major a port city. Uh, you see here uh, the local town 
uh, which remained under local rule, so the Europeans controlled just the fort itself, but also a bunch of canoes here. And I'll give you next a, oh, I went too fast, uh, a contemporary vision. You see what the canoes actually are, are like. This is, this is Elmina Castle nowadays. Its roofs are different now than they used to be. Um, but this was an area that was, it was important in slave trade as well, but this particular port was the center of gold trade for all of West Africa. This is a early 18th century image of the Kingdom of Savi in the, what's now the Republic of Benin. And these are images of, uh, over here, this is the, the main uh, palace courtyard, and then the others are owned, uh, directed by uh, European merchants in the area. So this is the English fort and the French fort and the Portuguese fort. This is an area about 40 miles inland from the coast, and then uh, we can go down to the coastal area, and there are the ships that, so this was a major, major center of slave trade. This, was, this region was known in the early 18th century as the slave trade because, or the slave coast, because it was the coast where the slave trade was largest, 20,000, 30, sometimes 30,000 people a year sent out from this region across the Atlantic. Um, and this gives you an idea of the scale and the organization of society that surrounded uh, what was otherwise a brutal and messy slave trade. Um, and here's another picture from a slightly earlier time. This is in the late 1600s, but the Kingdom of Benin in Nigeria, very near where the Niger River reached the coast. Um, and one interesting thing is that though horses don't do very well in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa because of Setsi fly, the King of Benin always made sure to have a horse, and here he's got his lions and so forth. So it's a procession away from what is a substantial city in the time of about 1650. Moving along the coast of Africa into Central Africa, this is the city of, of Luongo. It was a city then. It's a much smaller city now. We'll take a look later on at Point Noir, which is uh, just a couple miles down the coast from Luongo used to be. This place was a major local kingdom that, again, concentrated the slave trade in the 17th and 18th century and into the 19th century. Um, but again, you get, so this is uh, drawn by English visitors. So you get English uh, labels up there. It gives you an idea of the, the range of activities and also just the the scale of the city. Here's a story from uh, Angola, uh, where um, uh, the Portuguese set up control uh, at, the, at the town of Luanda, which they created in 1575, and where uh, they uh, ruled a certain amount of the African coast and where they centered a, a slave trade that went across the ocean to Brazil in particular. Uh, but they were involved in diplomatic relations with the local folks. And here's uh, Ana Njinga, um, a, I keep pushing the wrong button, that'll keep going on, um, who uh, was the sister of, the, of a young king who died and then she took over as regent and eventually she took over as, as king. So she was a major political figure from about 1600 to 1640. She died in her 80s in the 1660s and negotiated and fought with and sometimes allied with the Portuguese uh, um, over a long period of time. This particular story is in her use when she was in her 20s and was not yet the king, but was the um, uh, major diplomat in talking with the Portuguese. The Portuguese folks arranged it so that while they would have a chair and she would have a mat to sit on so she'd be at a lower level than they were, and so she brought in one of her retainers to get down on his knees, and she sat on that person's back and continued the negotiations, which worked out pretty well for her. The Portuguese ended up making a deal with her to withdraw from a fort, and then didn't withdraw from the fort, so they went to war for a few years. In any case, this is uh, one of those, a story that's gained a lot of attention um, in the history of Central Africa. Now we go around the Cape of Good Coast to hope to East Africa, and look at these drawings of uh, cities up and down the East African coast. So I got out of Africa for this, for Aden, which was a major shipping coast. There's the Red Sea going up this way. This is the way over to India. 
but the city of Mombasa uh, was on, it's on an island in a river in, on the coast of Kenya. It's now a you know, really big uh, city, but it was a major port and a place where Portuguese built a fort when they first got there. Further down the coast is Kilwa, again, a, an island very close to the coast that had been a major center of uh, trade by Swahili-speaking people up and down the East African coast from uh, as early as 800 uh, CE, 800 AD. And then further down the coast, the town of Sofala in uh, Mozambique is over there. Um, and I just went past the mosque in, in Kilwa. So there, uh, um, the mosque in Kilwa was built in around 1200 um, and uh, uh, was you know, there as the Portuguese arrived. It, it may have been represented someplace on that map that we saw. Uh, but again, uh, urban culture up and down the east coast of Africa was, was well established for some time. Okay, so now we'll hop to 1950, which is the end of the colonial period, right? So Africa was in a very short period of time, really in the 1890s, was taken over by uh, French and English and Portuguese and to a lesser degree German uh, expeditions, troops, that suddenly the continent found itself under foreign rule and remained under foreign rule until roughly 1960 is a year in which so many African countries got independent. The process added a bit longer. Uh, but this is late in the colonial period and this is the city of Dakar in West Africa, um, which at this time was a city of uh, a little over 100,000 people. Um, and here's a picture of Dakar further up. So the place we were looking at it a minute ago is up here. These are villages on this peninsula, in, which is way on the west side of uh, the African continent. And I'm picking out the village of Fan and Pointe de Fan here because we'll come back and look at what's going on there uh, later on in the presentation. Okay, and then this is, this is popular culture in 1950s and 60s uh, Dakar. Uh, this cartoonist became very uh, famous, and uh, the story is, uh, I mean, these guys over here asking, who's making all that noise? And this guy here says, oh, it's Fato. Once again, she's put too much uh, pepper in the soup, uh, and so she's upset, and it's nice to work the goat in. Um, okay. Um, so here's Dakar again. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, the French reestablished control, and so here's Charles de Gaulle coming visiting with notables in the city of Dakar. And, uh, and this is just a nice portrait of a woman from the area. You can see the gold earrings and gold pendant that she wears. Um, fancy jewelry is a big thing in this part of the world. Now we've moved over to Ghana, and uh, 19, this is late 1950s, and this is. These are women in the, in the city emphasizing urban life. And uh, a, a, it's not that so much that this particular uh, photo is so famous, but this moment was famous. This is 1957 when Ghana be, gained its independence, the uh, first country in West Africa to gain independence from Britain. And Queen Elizabeth, who had been on the throne for just five years, came to uh, celebrate independence with them. And then her, there's her daughter, Princess Anne. But the uh, one in the center is the Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah, the leading figure, one would say, in the generation of achievement of political independence by uh, African countries. He was a student in the US, by the way. He was a, a student at Lincoln University and University of Pennsylvania, just up the coast a bit. This is, I'm cheating a little bit, this is 1950s, not 1950s, but it's 70s or 80s, but this is the city of Abidjan in, uh, in Ivory Coast. Uh, Ivory Coast, right next to Ghana, did very well in um, cocoa production, and the city became a real center of, of uh, wealth and prestige, and so this was, uh, and it's spread amongst the lagoons on the coast. There's a look at it. Another look at uh, just life and times in the 1950s. So the, here's the city of Kano again with just a family portrait. And Bamako, another internal uh, city. Because this one's in color, you can see the trees that weren't so visible in the, in the picture of Timbuktu that we saw a while earlier. 
Uh, okay, so we're going to do a little bit with uh, music here. Um, the, the, uh, as African countries were working their way up to independence and gaining independence, the U.S. government uh, encouraged cultural missions, and Louis Armstrong in particular made several visits up and down the African coast, uh, playing with his own band, playing with, playing with local musicians. So um, you can tell from uh, the, uh, I've done it again, I keep going the wrong way. Uh, I'm trying to look at the, uh, these particular umbrellas tell you for sure that it's from Ghana. Uh, all right, now this is, this is uh, Point Noir. This is the place where the city of um, Luango used to be. It's now a port. Uh, and so you get to see the huge size of the timbers that they're taking out in the area, but also um, a, a, a beach with fishing communities along it. And then just a, a, a nice um, look at a um, middle-aged woman from uh, Point Noir. Uh, and these are the sorts of postcards. This is a little earlier. This is 1930s with the... the uh, Po the postage stamp on there, but the sort of uh, stamps that uh, French like to send home uh, about the areas that were under their control at the time. Now we're back to music. So Kinshasa is um, one of Africa's really big cities, pretty much 10 million people uh, on, along the Congo River, ac across the river from Brazzaville. On the f that was the French side and Kinshasa was on the Belgian side in the days of the Belgian Congo, and a major cultural scene developed there in the 1950s. It's worth pointing out that the European colonial regimes tried to keep the town small, and did not want people coming to Kinshasa, and especially they didn't want women coming to the city of Kinshasa. They were supposed to stay in the rural areas. But as the change happened, 1958, they opened up elections in 1960, all of a sudden Congo was, in, was independent, and the city of Kinshasa drew, grew by leaps and bounds. So clubs, and this musical group, it's a terrible photo, but what I want to, I want to point you the drum set here, and then also otherwise the music is mostly percussion instruments. Um, then these are the these are the clubs, and these are women and young women partying, uh, that, that was a brand new um, pattern that really caught on. Um, and then here's the band. So this is the actual band that was playing the music that I had running just before we got started. I was going to try to hold off and, list and play for you a per very particular uh, selection, but I couldn't handle the logistics. But this is uh, Franco. Here's a, another look at Franco himself. Uh, uh, Franco and the TPOK -okay Jazz, Tout Puissant OK -okay Jazz, the all powerful OK -okay Jazz, that's the name of his band, formed right about 1960 and that lasted as long as he lasted into the 90s. So he lost his life in the AIDS epidemic at the end. But this guy sold more millions of records uh, than you could imagine throughout the African continent. Um, and the music that you heard, you can tell fascinating stories about it. That it was uh, drew on local traditions, but also drew a lot on Cuban music and on Mexican music and transformed it again and again. It's, and with, um, really with YouTube, uh, you, you can uh, do the whole history of the evolution of that music that so many people throughout Africa have listened to. For a little further down the coast, here's Luanda in the 1950s, Luanda under Portuguese rule, so they had a long, nasty civil war between in the 1960s and 70s, really going on till the 90s. But re because of what happens with cities and refugees, the sit population of Luanda got larger and larger. So here it is in the late 1950s, it's already up to 800,000 people. And this is just an aerial view of all the tightly packed uh, houses. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, I don't want to take too much time about this, but these African cities, as they grow from um, rather small numbers to huge numbers, do so with very little public investment. 
So how do they build the water supplies and the school systems and the transportation systems? It's a story of just community interaction and small scale profiteering. Very, very different from the way in which cities grew in North America and really, really interesting as just social construction. But we're going to take a little bit of a look at education. There's, but we're not, and So here, here's Sierra Leone, which was a, a highly educated center of British colonial Africa. Missionary groups worked there early. So this is the Church Missionary Society and the boys coming, marching out from this school. Uh, this is 40s or 50s. And then another one, a slightly earlier photo of the Wesleyan High School. And from where I've seen, you can see, yes, indeed, these, a lot of these guys are high school students. Uh, there's, that'll be the principal, this will be the teachers. Um, but that's it, I, I really was amazed at how few photos I could find of education in Africa in the 1950s because it wasn't a priority. And only as the independent governments came on did the schools really begin to expand. And so we'll come back and look at education again later on. But here's a look at the 10 largest cities in Africa um, and with numbers for numbers of people. Okay, so 11.7 in million in Lagos, 11.4 million in Cairo, Kinshasa, 9.9 million. These are official city populations in 2010. They have m metropolitan populations expanding beyond them. Uh, but there, there's a lot of them. We'll, we'll come take a look at Nairobi in a bit. Here's a, okay, so this is 1950, 33 million urban population. 2010, 400 million urban population for the African continent out of a billion people, okay? And then they know the population continues to grow rapidly and so these are expectations. So Africa is mo have been moving from a really rural continent into a pretty urban continent. And here it is city by city. Um, uh, these are the, the um, Yellow spikes are of growth rates between 1995 and 2010. The blue spikes are projected population from 2010 to 2025. Here's Abuja, it's got the biggest one. Why is that? Abuja was not a city at all or hardly a city until it became the capital of Nigeria in the 1990s. And now it really is the capital of Nigeria and the city continues to grow at a dramatic rate and I'm sure these guys are right, it will, it will grow up to a eight or 10 million uh, population size. Now cities can still uh, be, um, you know, they're not all concrete and multiple, st multiple stories. So this is, this is Ouagadougou, uh, the capital of Burkina Faso, a city of a million people. Um, and this is the mosque, the main mosque, and this is the market around the front of the mosque. Um, Deal. And this is a this is a scene in the in the other end of Ouagadougou, um, so a mix of, of different types of transportation, all kinds of little shops. Uh, sometimes the roads are paved, and sometimes not. This is Benin, the country that I spent my earliest African times in, and the place where I'm sort of most close to what's going on. And this is just a procession through uh, the middle of town in, in Cotonou, a population that was 120,000 people when I first went there and just at about an even million now. Uh, and in Cotonou, this in particular is a motorbike city. I mean, there are a lot of cars, but they're really motorbikes. These are taxis over here on the left. Um, and at the edge of town, I mean, these are young women doing what young women used to do, carrying things around. So that part of life goes on at the same time as life in the tall buildings in the middle of town goes on. This is another look at Luanda. So Luanda is a coastal city. We get the beach here and just a close up look at what we saw above from a, from a distance. Um, okay, so big sports continent um, and uh, every, every African city has a, a huge soccer stadium Many of them built by the Chinese, wherever, whoever build the things, they all have them. And here's, this is the Zambian team having won the Africa Cup. Uh, 
but those of you who follow the field know that there are no shortage of, of uh, major African players on all the big pro teams around the world. And here's where it comes from. And when I got there in the 60s, there were still, there were kids kicking, kicking some imitation of a ball around a, a, a dirt lot and uh, starting to get good at this game. So here's, here's this, the, you know, the sort of more glamorized version of the city of, the, of Nairobi, uh, a city of a scant five million people, uh, but the metropolis of Eastern Africa. And here's a, here's a contrast showing the, the fancy buildings, uh, all the nice greenery and the apartments up there. And then in the foreground, this is tea. They, they grow a lot of tea in, in uh, Kenya. And then these are, I mean, these people who are doing the work here are definitely not the ones who live in those buildings. Uh, but all the different parts of life fit together. Uh, and then these are guys in another part of uh, Nairobi. Uh, so these are the down and outs on the other. And here's one guy with a phone. And then this guy, maybe that's a phone too. Uh, in, it's in the la within the last 10 years, as cell phones have got good, it's completely transformed communication on the African continent, because telephones were, 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 with landlines were no good at all, and uh, all of a sudden now people are in contact with one another. I, I, I do not know what the changes are going to be, I just know that things are really going to change based on this new technology. Um, this is more, um, more uh, political cartooning, you know, another 50 years later, this one is in in Somalia, it's, about, it's a joke about the Kenyans or the Ethiopians each um, extracting what they can from uh, Somalia uh, with a little international money flowing there as well. But here's the other side of life in Somalia, uh, refugee camps. All right, so a lot of, lot of fighting, a lot of people driven off their homelands and then end up living in boxes like these at the edge of town under some uh, um, NGO or international organization. All right, we'll finish up with a little more look at education. And um, so these are percentages of adult literacy. And then you can see that a little more literacy on the southern half of the continent than the northern half of the continent, uh, though with exceptions in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt. Uh, but on the other hand, if you run into somebody in Africa, you should expect they can read. Uh, and then you might even ask how many languages they can read in. Um, uh, so there's this sort of a story, right? And it's got the, with the uh, USAID uh, bucket on, on basic sort of primary schools, which do exist, I mean, that's, that's the beginning. Uh, but uh, we also have academies, and I'm not sure that this is the Nigerian Naval Academy, but this is a photo from the Nigerian Naval Academy. Um, and, uh, and then this is a, a joint um, training session um, of divers uh, in which the British Navy and the Nigerian Navy are uh, cooperating. And the way to tell who's who is by the color of the uniforms, right? The blue uh, uniforms of the Nigerians. Um, and, uh, and then here's the Kenyan Navy, or some of it. Um, okay. And now we're back to Dakar, where the uh, Université Sheikh Anta Diop, this major university with 70,000 students, is exactly in the place where I showed you in an early slide, the, the village of Fan and Fan Point. All right, so Dakar is extended out that way. It's many times what its site was before. And uh, here's a, um, a massive lecture hall uh, with the lecturer up at the front. Uh, and this sort of a story has expanded itself all over the continent. So I've been counting number, the, the number of universities that has grown in Africa. Um, and it's, uh, there's a, five years ago, there were 100 universities in Nigeria. Now there are 100 universities in Congo and 60 universities in Ethiopia. You know, they're not all top flight universities. Many of them are struggling confessional schools and so forth, or, pro or professional schools. But the, the focus on education, the education in and education in Africa has taken a really dramatic turn in recent times, and we'll see what the results will be. There we are. 
Uh, let me stop at that point and see what questions and comments you have. The, oh, who constructed those buildings? Oh, do I know? Um, uh, they, uh, um, they are certainly built by local construction firms, okay? So there's international money and so forth, but the money comes from local entrepreneurs who build up their fortunes. And so real estate in Africa, you know, a lot of wild and crazy stories. So, but in any case, basically you expect the buildings uh, you know, the, the, the ones that are in the center of town and under the big glass buildings, which Nairobi has some, there it's a more complicated, more international story. But basically, it's, some, it's, it's a question, if I understand your question, it's mobilizing local resources to build the this, this city. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So thank you. Let me try to repeat the, the question. Is uh, from the point of view of uh, a person you work with, live with, who is uh, from Nigeria, the, the the on the one hand the, the tremendous interest in expansion in education, and on the other hand the groups, especially Boko Haram, in uh, Nigeria that oppose education, that do whatever they can to destroy education, and and this is. Um, I, you know, all I can do is offer the dilemma. I'm not going to succeed in explaining it any more than, than anybody else, but it's happening every place and in every corner of every place, all right? So the tremendous amount of expansion, which leads social transformation and other people who want, they want, it's not even that they want to go back into the past because this involves destroying history, right? I mean, you have to go over to the, like the destruction of Palmyra by, by ISIS, where people, any representation of what was there in the past has to be gone. They have some idea of a completely new start. So there's, um, um, I just, uh, to, to do, there, this also involves wars in Nigeria between Christians and Muslims, all right? So the, the struggles between Christians and Muslims are going on in Nigeria. It also strikes me that the, the peace that is certainly to come at some point between Christian and Muslims is as likely to be worked out in Africa as any place else just because there's so many people on both sides bumping into each other all the time. Uh, sir, is the AIDS epidemic still a uh, cause for major concern in Africa, especially with uh, such a high impoverished yeah. rate? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's like uh, we were almost in communication. I took the AIDS slide out because I was afraid I'd get too much, too much carried away with too much time. But in the period from especially the 1990s through 2010, the AIDS epidemic continued to expand, took more populations. For most African countries, their expectation of life at birth has fallen, sometimes by as many as 10 years. I mean, just devastating changes to the overall population structure caused by that. And now more and more medication is working well, so people are living with AIDS, but millions of people living with AIDS on the African population. It's a tremendous drain on it's the whole continent, but especially the whole southern half of the continent. Um, Are there more increased opportunities for higher education masters for universities? Are there more opportunities for higher education masters, degrees, and so forth? Yes, the degree programs are being built. Um, and then in what fields, especially technical fields, I've noted that while there are some, uh, some fairly impressive universities being founded, they tend not to have history departments. My, uh, they, uh, they have um, development and you know, trying to look forward. My experience is what happens after a few years, people run into problems and they ask, what is the history of this? And so you know, the history begins to show up. Um, 
On the other hand, we live in a world with all these international lists of the top 100 universities, right? And so, you know, African Union universities don't make it onto the global list of top 100 universities. But there's a top 100 African universities. It's easy to find. Just go look for it on Wikipedia. Um, and, you know, and then the parents are always complaining about the quality of the education their children are getting whatever. So it, it's quite a mix. But I, I, I will say myself as someone who was taught and had students who finished up high school in Africa and entered my classes at the University of Pittsburgh or at Northeastern University where I were before and who were at the head of the class from the beginning to the end of the semester, there is some really excellent education that takes place and some opportunities for people to rise to um, positions that, would, that require high level of education. Do I think foreign aid money is good or bad for uh, foreign aid education? Well, a lot depends on the terms of any, any aid. But I, I will say that my overall imp impression is that for Africa, the continent has really been very short on, on um, direct foreign investment uh, on the corporate side, all right, as well as aid to governments. So from the 1970s through the turn of the century, um, because African governments found themselves in debt through a complicated set of, I don't know, currency manipulations, I would say, they found themselves very sharply restricted by the World Bank and the and, uh, International Monetary Fund, such that schools and hospitals, all kinds of public services were cut way back. And there wasn't bilateral aid to make up for that, okay? So, so Africa has been really short on investment in the region for a long period of time. Uh, now, of course, we have growing Chinese investment in Africa, and that's bringing probably some expansions in investment from other countries in competition with the Chinese, so maybe things look a little better. The, that is, I'm avoiding the, the, the tough part of the question that you're giving me, which is, how can you accept foreign aid and then maintain control of the policies in your own, in your own country? Um, and that's an ongoing struggle. I, but I would say that the level, uh, just the passage of time, uh, but that African countries are better able to get recognition that the policies that are set in a given country should be treated as the appropriate policies by advisors from international countries. But that one's going to remain a tough question. How do I define population? Oh yeah. Oh boy. How? Do, well, the I, the problem of defining the size of the um, population of a city is probably not any more difficult in Africa than any place else. It's always got this fuzzy part around it. But there is maybe there's a question of whether the city government takes responsibility for people who live out in the slum areas, right? Or whose only access to electricity is by pirating electricity from the main lines and so forth. It is true that African countries are not yet really bureaucratized enough that all of them are conducting censuses. You know, they don't have the census. They're estimating people rather than coming and knocking on the door and talking to people. So um, various kinds of you know, social insurance programs and so forth that you just sort of expect here, even if you live in a poor neighborhood, are not established there. It's a problem. We have time for one more question. Um, sir, it's, it's pretty clear that um, urbanization is definitely taking place in Africa. Um, we recently read Heart of Darkness, which was written in the late 1800s, which talks a lot about the tribal areas in Congo and Africa. Um, what percentage or if any remains of kind of the tribal and traditional Africa? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Heart of Darkness starts right at the bottom of the Congo River and works its way up to what's now Kinshasa and on the river up beyond there. Uh, huge amounts of change, but r rural life is still there. On the other hand, in that particular area, a, um, a, lo a uh, 
an, a sort of evangelical Christianity took hold and formed. It was, this, it was the Kimbangu movement, which that group grew so long that they're so, so far they're now a member of the World Council of Churches. So lots and lots of changes. Uh, but the old traditions continue to influence. Okay, so I think a fair comparison would be to look at rural areas in our own country here and how those have changed over 100 years and then look at rural areas in Congo or another country and ask how those have changed over time. I mean, of course, they have to go to school and in different languages than before. But on the other hand, the grandparents are still there reminding people of the way things used to be. It's a really, uh, it's a, it's a really interesting question. People want to change and at the same time maintain their old ways. Don't know. All right. Sir, one quick question. Uh, my class is about to read uh, Things Fall Apart. Yeah. And just your general thoughts over there. Yeah. So, Things Fall Apart, Africa's most famous novel, really, written by Chinua Achebe when he was in his late 20s. Uh, story is often presented to those of us overseas as a story about colonialism coming into this Igbo village and uh, uh, changing the life of uh, uh, Okonkwo, this senior man you know, who does things in the old ways and is so confused by the big changes. But m another way to read that story is to look at the difference between Okonkwo, the senior hero, and his son so as the two of them are set in opposition to another. The son adopts Christianity, uh, and that's the struggle between the parents. So to see that book as a story of not, a, it, it is of outside imposition, but it's also a story of generational change within Igbo society. And so to look at it that way, I think will enable you to look at all the different characters and how they play one off another and get a, a sense of the complexity and the same problems we've just been talking about, about how to preserve the old and also get benefits of the new. Thank you very much for your time.